activism and diversification. As part of the Think Tech series, today's show is The Arts in Hawaii. I'm your host, Donna Blanchard, and joining me today is Tammy Haliopua Baker, Assistant Professor of Hawaiian Theater and Playwriting in the Department of Theater at, um, and Dance at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, here to talk about her work combining language and theater. Welcome to the show, Tammy. Mahalo for having me. <laughs> Our show's being streamed live on Ustream.tv and Spreaker.com. These links are embedded in our site, so to get these live streams, just go to thinktechhawaii.com. And if you want to join us in our downtown studio, just email jfidel at j at fidel.com. And that's Fidel with two L's. Tammy, I'm yes. so anxious to have you on here. I really Mahalo. love the work that you do um, and the heart with which you do everything that you do. And um, I'll just say that uh, the first time the first time I met you was at a show at the oh, Randai yes, show, yes, yes, right? Yes. But the first time we really got to talk when was when I took your playwriting class at Kumukuhua Theater, yeah. and you taught with obviously a great deal of knowledge about the work, but more than that, such a nurturing spirit that I think everyone in the room, honestly, I, um, we had a very vast, uh, um, diverse uh, mm -hmm. uh, amount of experience in the room, and I think that everyone there felt comfortable with everyone else. Mm -mm. I mean, we had a playwright in the room who we produced at Kumukua mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right. later that year, uh, down to me, I have n had never done anything like that before. Um, and I think we all felt uh, as though we gained a great deal, and, and you can only do that when you are comfortable with the artistic process. So, mahalo to you. Oh, mahalo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if we can start off with, tell us a little bit about you from whence you come. Okay, all right. Um, I guess we'll go right back to little childhood. Yeah? Yeah. Hanabara days. <laughs> uh, I grew up on the island of Kauai. Uh, in Kapa'a, Kapahi actually, Pu'uka, upper Kapahi area, more country area. Um, however, the first uh, eight years of my life, uh, I was living next door to my grandmother and also next door to Mama San and Papa San, who were um, plantation workers who had uh, developed uh, houses for themselves and turned them into rentals over time. So I grew up in this plantation uh, atmosphere where we didn't have, we had a very minimal lifestyle. Um, we raised chickens and we raised, you know, grew food, uh, lived off the land a little bit, never had running water in the, uh, well, for a bath and toilet that was all outhouse. <laughs> oh, so wow. uh, real meager living, I think. And then when I was about the third grade, so going into about nine years old, um, my parents actually pulled enough money together to buy a place of their own. And my mom actually went to work at that time. That was the first time my mom actually went out and got a job mm. um, from the time I was a baby. And then she had my sister and I. Um, and from there, we continued working uh, pasture lands and having cattle. My grandpa was a paniolo, I guess you could say. He was a cattleman, and so was all his friends and my uncles and, and on my dad's side of the family. So I grew up with that kind of country living, I guess, uh, that taught me a lot about work ethic and um, grounded me, I think, as a person. Um, my family till today, like all my uncles and cousins, they're all still hunters and gatherers, you know, they, they live off the land and do hunting and fishing and that's the kind of lifestyle I was surrounded oh, wow. by as a youth and um, yeah, it's given me a great respect for everything, all the blessings that have come in my life, you know, because, because we grew up with nothing really yeah. in the beginning, you you tend to really appreciate the food on your plate when you have to go and get the eggs every morning before yeah. you go to school or whatever like that. And yeah, 
I would th and working together. Yeah. Right? You all needed it. So you were you grew up in an ensemble. Yes, an ensemble family. <laughs> yeah. Everybody had their kuleana. Everybody had their responsibility. Mm -hmm. What they were what they had to take care of in order to make the ohana or the family function properly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 Cool. So when were you, and it was just you and your sister? Me and my sister. And then yeah. you had extended family nearby. Yes, yeah. All my um, my dad's siblings, basically, uh, were on Kauai, except for one, and they all had children. So I was the eldest cousin on that side, taking care of all the little cousins, mm -hmm. right, after a while, when I got a little older. Yeah. Um, so my dad's family is still basically on Kauai. Yeah. So in that meager living, what were evenings like? What was evening entertainment? Uh, Storytelling, oh, basically. Oh, I thought it might be the case. <laughs> Storytelling. I mean, there was, I guess, um, the little TV with the rabbit ears, but you could only catch like one, two channels. And Kauai, you know, is like we lived in the boondocks. We yeah. didn't have cable. Yeah. So really it was storytelling, singing, talking stories. Telling jokes. My grandpa was like famous for his jokes. <laughs> yeah, and um, my my uncle them. I think they continued on. Even my dad. My dad's a jokester. You know, and then the storytelling is is really important to us because that's how traditions and histories were passed down. And so storytelling has always been a cornerstone for me. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something that I try to continue to practice till today. Um, it, not as often now, but when my children were younger, every night there was a story before they went to bed. And oh. it was usually a telling story, not necessarily reading from a book. So that's something that, you know, my husband and I have tried to instill, the retelling of traditional stories or histories, yeah. um, different events to build their repertoire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and when you were young um, at home, were, were those stories told in Hawaiian? No, they were they were pretty much in pidgin. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, or Hawaiian Creole English. Yeah, is the correct terminology now. <laughs> yeah. But they were pretty much in pidgin. Pidgin was my first language. Uh, I had exposure to Hawaiian from um, a great aunt, actually. Um, my mom's really good friend who was like my auntie because you know extended family right you're not necessarily related by blood but by community and being raised together so um, this auntie auntie D her mom was actually from Niho so there was exposure to Hawaiian as a child because auntie D used to help to you know take care of us and look over us because she was next door mm -hmm. um, and so early on um, Aside from going to church at St. Catherine's, I grew up pretty strong Catholic. And that was how my both my parents were raised, and so they continued that on with my sister and I. Um, but I would sometimes go church with my auntie too, so I would get the exposure to Keakua Mana Church, which was in Hawaiian. So. Mm. Um, I guess double up some Sundays, get two masks. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, no, no. <laughs> there were different events that I would um, be with them. So I was around that community too. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Did, so you were exposed to the language young enough, do you think, that the, you naturally you know, latched um, on? I, I was around it. Um, and so I think that my ears perhaps had an understanding mm. of sound patterns. And, and granted, there were some, you know, phrases and words that you understand, but I was never conversational until I went to the university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in high school, I had a year of Hawaiian, and then our kumu, he left. So there was no more Hawaiian <laughs> at Kapa'a. Mm -hmm. um, and then it wasn't until I enrolled at Manoa that uh, I, you know, was able to re-embrace that and take multiple years of Hawaiian and become conversational and more fluent in the language. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about your first exposure to art. Okay. Um, okay. The performance was mm -hmm, through mm -hmm. church? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, growing up in that kind of really active church group, there was always singing. There was sometimes the the passion plays, right? You mm. know, where um, sunrise service, maybe we would deliver something or um, the performances at um, the midnight mass. And then through that, I also um, got exposed to um, music, right? So, and not just, not just, church music. Um, we did more contemporary music mm -hmm. and there was a, a small group of us that were crazy enough to take it on and <laughs> were asked actually by um, one of our leaders in church, Uncle Clyde and Auntie Patty. They um, asked us if we would like to uh, really like make a band and <laughs> do music. <laughs> so through that I had exposure to um, songwriting and composition and then performing and we actually recorded an album. Oh, <laughs> it was kind of Isaiah, right? What, is the it band. on iTunes? And, oh, no, I <laughs> highly doubt that, actually. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but it was a way to get the message across to our generation and um, rewrite some more contemporary um, uh, popular music oh. so like Club Nouveau when they redid Lean On Me you know we took that and um, made the words more uh, I guess made the words relate to the message that we were trying to get across where you can lean on Keokua you can lean on God and he can be there for you and your friends through fellowship can be there you know so yeah. we um, kind of tweaked it and used that and yeah, that was a very interesting experience. We um, <laughs> kind of toured Neighbor Island and <laughs> was oh, like, whoa, wow. you know, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. How old were you? Um, that I was, I think I was like 14, 15, 16, something around there. Yeah. Oh. So it was yeah. in, the, in the teens. Yeah. Prior to that, I guess my first like on stage experience was when we did um, the, uh, like a Christmas play. And I was in the first grade, and I played Mother Mary. Oh, <laughs> and I remember holding my sister's doll, <laughs> and that was Baby Jesus. And we sang Away in the Manger. And, oh, yeah, you remember yeah, it. I remember it. I remember That's that something. moment. I even remember the smell of that doll. I mean, I, yeah, it's it's quite amazing. Baby dolls used to have a very particular yes. scent, didn't yes. they? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The, I mean, it was plastic yellow hair, right? Yeah. But the uh, the fabric that was on that doll, and actually even that the face, what the body was made of, had a particular scent that I'll never forget. I don't think they use that plastic anymore because I know which, <laughs> yeah. I remember the smell of the those smell. baby dolls. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your first theatrical experience really stuck with you. That's yes. cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you had some really wonderful opportunities through school. Yes, yes. Um, so in high school, actually transitioning from um, intermediate to high school, there was a, a program that started through the DOE throughout the state of Hawaii. And it was a program to teach theater, basically, to DOE students as an after-school program, and that was the birth of the performing arts centers throughout the state. Um, I'm going to say it was probably 86, 1986, mm. um, and so Arnold Meister on the island of Kauai uh, was the, the head of that program that opened up. What was really special about Kauai's program, because now we have all these programs that started out in the, in the mid to late 80s across the state. So we have Castle Performing Arts here. We have others like Kaimuki Performing Arts Centers, and which are fall, uh, uh, framed after the same principles to get students into theater, whether it be technical theater, actual performance on stage, um, and, and build self-confidence through the arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the, so one of the desires behind that. What was really unique about Kauai was that um, it was all three high schools came together to create Kauai Performing Arts Center. We have only three high schools on the island, so Kapa'a, Kauai, and Waimea, and everyone auditioned at all the different schools, and then they picked students from all three schools to come together every day after school for two and a half, three hours 
to learn theater and to eventually mount a production wow. at the end of the school year. So it was a really nice um, networking that, that took place. Because the, the schools are so spread out on the island, there isn't a lot of exchange, really, yeah. you know, and everybody kind of roots for their school and doesn't really mingle necessarily unless you have family on that side of the island or sure. whatever. So <laughs> this was a really nice way to bring youths together, you know, um, to work collectively on a program and, and learn about the collaborative art of theater, you know. So the DOE was busing students from all over the island uh, to be together? No, How were no, they getting together? we had to make our own arrangements uh, for travel. Okay. So those of us, like when I first started, I was a freshman. So the, the students who were seniors, you know, we tried to talk with them and work out arrangements so we could like just carpool and catch a ride with them. Oh yeah. And as the years went by, you know, you grow up and then you be the one leading the carpool, right? So I did that for four years, of, well, ninth grade through twelfth grade. I was a part of the first four years of Kauai Performing Arts Center. Yeah. Do you think the primary goal of that, I, I think that's really phenomenal, that's an amazing opportunity. I grew up just outside of Chicago and we didn't have anything like that. You know, you mm -hmm. think a major metropolitan area right. would have right, a, right, right, right. more of an arts commitment. Um, do you think their primary goal was for kids to develop their confidence or do you think they were really investing in you know, art? Um, I know that Arnold was really investing in, in the theatrical arts yeah. and that's always been his passion and that's what he's that passion he shared with us um, I think to sell the program to the DOE they probably had a multi-prong approach mm -hmm. where students would learn these skills and those skills and which would lead to leaders in the community right um, and self-confidence and all of the wonderful things that go with being on stage and yeah. working together yeah. sure yeah. That's understandable. Mm -hmm. It's hard to quantify yeah. the, uh, arts and aesthetics in our lives. So. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't mean to get you off no, track. No, no, I just no. got fine. a little it's curious fine. about yeah. that. So you went through that program mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you worked. What was your primary mode of artistic expression? As uh, acting. Okay. Yeah, acting. And then because most we did musicals most of the time, uh, everyone was expected to, you know, learn to be a triple threat, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they, <laughs> they tried to put us in there. Right. <laughs> they tried to teach us the singing and dancing and acting. And some of us excelled in, in multiple, I guess, venues, not always. We had singers with us who have, you know, gone on to become recording stars. So Glenn mm -hmm. Materis was part of one of the first part of fame our first show um, and then there's been other people who have come through the program and you know become surfers and and all <laughs> kinds of different things dancers and um, a few actors though but a lot of musicians have come through the program a lot of musicians and the shows that you were doing then were like off-broadway yeah so um, fame princess and the p um, mm -hmm. uh, fiddler on the roof uh, the whiz yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was really a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I laugh about the Wiz. <laughs> I've done the, done the Wiz too. Was there okay. was there a single black person in your cast? Um, we had part black people and oh, yeah, yeah. We didn't have. A and single. then we had like <laughs> <laughs> Filipino, of course, and then part Hawaiian. So we had a little bit of brownness. A little thing. bit of brown. Yeah. And I don't think we really understood yeah. the impact <laughs> that yeah. was why that the Wiz was different than the Wizard of Oz, yeah. but it's a lot of fun to do. Oh, that's such a wonderful show to do. Who'd yeah. you play? Um, I, I had multiple roles, you know, mostly ensemble stuff, but I, yeah. one of the more enjoyable ones was the poppy, you know, the poppy that seduces oh, the line. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. And, oh, God. Emerald City people, and then, oh, you know, yeah. the, the whole, the grovel scene with the Wicked Queen, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was I was the wicked queen. <laughs> oh, fun! Okay, <laughs> fun, very fun. Uh, yeah. uh, There's a long history of those. <laughs> okay. I don't know why. Uh, okay, so you mm -hmm. were primarily focused um, as an actor, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what did was there anyone else involved in the arts formally in your family? Um, 
Not really. No, I, my mom was a hula dancer when she was in high school and shortly after that, but mm. um, not, no, not, not necessarily in the theater. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you came out of high school mm -hmm. and I assume you're going through that time in your junior, senior year where you're <laughs> filling mm -hmm. out college applications and where were you? Well, um, what solidified it for me was um, the, my, the summer of my junior year, actually, I went to this program, again, another DOE program, which I would love to see come back, mm -hmm. um, which, it, which was SPB, the Summer Program for the Enhancement of Basic Education. And there were multiple um, uh, tracks in which students could enroll. And what they did was they took applications from the whole state and took the top 20 students in every field. So there was um, Chinese studies, uh, journalism, oceanography, theater, and then there was a health track too, so, you know, for potential doctors. And wow. um, so that was a six-week program that was held at um, Kennedy Theater, actually, up at UH Manoa. And that summer, um, uh, there was a great imprint put on me that this is some place I could continue my passion, my enjoyment being on stage. And over that summer, you know, we took classes, college classes and learn technical theater, learn design and acting as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think acting on the main stage at Kennedy, uh, we did Taming of the Shrew. And that really, I, I, I was ready to come to school here, you know? And so in the summer of 88, I believe my, my brain just kind of went, this is where I need to come back to. I need to find a way to get back here. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, in the application process, trying to get into school, um, I, my grades and everything, well, my grades were great, but I didn't have all the tools to get into Manoa, actually. I was lacking in math, you know, that was one of the things. So my, GR, uh, my scores, my SAT scores were not that great. Um, I don't want to bad mount my school, Kapa. Uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe it was just me. I wasn't necessarily pegged as someone who was going to go to college, right? Um. And so I was never really put on that track. Um, so going uh, to Manoa was a little bit of a hurdle. I ended up, though, uh, very fortunate getting into the College Opportunities Program, which was a program for minority retention students that allows you to experience college life the summer before your freshman year and if you pass you can enter the university uh, in a probationary um, status oh wow. um, and so I uh, got into the program did very well because I wanted to stay on Oahu this was like moving to the big city right yeah. coming from Kauai <laughs> which was the rock right the country and everything <laughs> this is where you know things could happen in my mind, you know, I could I could learn so much more from different people and and make you know make make a difference. I think um, being yeah. So, anyways, yeah. that's yeah. Where am I going with that? So, <laughs> entered the university and my freshman year, I declared theater as a major. I what you know, other friends were oh I don't know I think I'll do liberal arts. I don't know I'm not sure what I want to do and yeah. this and that and you said I know I said, I'm doing theater you know <laughs> and then. Oh yeah, I want to take a Hawaiian language class. You need a language, so I took Hawaiian. And then, um, in my mind, right over the years, was this: Oh man, that would be so cool if we had Hawaiian plays. <laughs> really, right? you were thinking really? that that young? Exactly. Like you know, in my early twenties, really, I was thinking, Wow, this. Yeah, I think that would be really awesome. And as I was, you know, learning theater. There was this wonderful exposure to Asian theater forms and um, Western theater. There's so much happening. Manoa is just a really, it, there, I don't think there's anything like it in the nation. No, I don't really. think there is either. So yeah. there was this really cool kind of synergy going on. And, and I was learning about, okay, what Hawaiian plays existed. And they were really far and few in between. And it was quite new, actually entering Manoa in, in 1990, actually, as a freshman, um, really the Hawaiian stuff was just starting to come out, you know, in, in the late mm -hmm. 80s. So in 83, I know that's Victoria Nalani Noble's first play. 
mm -hmm. right? So we finally have a play with Kumukahua that's written by a Hawaiian, right? In, and about Hawaiian content. Mm -hmm. And then she continued to write and, and was mentored to produce more stories, right? In, in the medium of theater. So I think the wheels were turning early on. And so by the time I was a senior, um, I wanted to direct a play in Hawaiian because, hey, we gotta have a Hawaiian play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so I went looking. I really went like looking through the Hamilton Library, Sinclair Library. I went down to the State Archives and Bishop Museum, and I'm like, there's gotta be plays written in Hawaiian, you know? Yeah. And I came across a, a few, um, uh, there's actually like about three bilingual plays that was written by Jean Charlot in the 60s. And two of them were actually produced um, at Punahou, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was produced with uh, students and teachers or kumu from Manoa and um, from Kamehameha, actually. So uh, these students that I'm talking about are now esteemed elders, you know, oh. that are some of the treasures that, you know, are our, our native speakers that are still alive who were involved in those two productions. Oh, wow. Right? So, okay, so then. Uh, I find that, but there's nothing all in Hawaiian. And, you know, it. a friend of mine, um, Rapley Nabori, who was working on his MFA in directing at the time that I was working on my, under, um, my undergrad, he had done a Hawaiian play in the lab theater as a kind of an experimental in conjunction with Kumu um, John Lake, actually. And his uh, halal performed in that. And I saw that and I was like, yes, yes. And um, they actually did one in English. So they were chanting in English, chanting like Hawaiian chant oh. style, but in English, oh, right? Interesting. And so there was Umiali Loa and then he did Death of Keowa. And my friends actually were involved in, in those two plays who were students of Kumu Lake, right? So I have a conversation with Rapley, and I say, Rapley, I want to do this in Hawaiian. And he says, well, you're going to have to write it. <laughs> and I went, what? No, I'm going to find a play. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm excited about directing at that time. You know, having a few years of being a performer, I saw directing as maybe the next step or the, the opportunity to really be in control of the creative process and paint the pictures. Um, so I, I really didn't think I was going to have to write it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's actually what came to pass. Yeah. Um, if I wanted to do it, I had to write it. You had to write it. Yeah. So your first foray into directing was also your first foray into and writing. Into writing a, f a, p a full play. Oh. Yeah. And that's when you became a triple threat. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. It's just a different yeah. triple. Yeah, different. <laughs> yeah, very different. And how did you, well, let me, um, let me go on a little tangent okay, here for a minute. Right. I'd like to talk about the differences between how you feel when you work as an actor and okay. what it does for you inside. Okay. You know, okay. that okay. makes us want to do it again. Okay. Versus what happens as a director. Mm. Okay. So as an actor, do you remember just some of the visceral feelings that you had when you started doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's the scent of that baby. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, yeah. I wasn't a trained actor at that time, but there's been moments like that that I carry with me. Yeah, and as uh, you know, as an actor, you're you're able to embody someone else's experience and learn from that experience, and then try to portray that experience for the audience so they can feel that as well. So being able to channel those things um, has always been very exciting. Mm -hmm. You know, and and when you hit those moments and the audience feels it there and they're with you, there's nothing like it. You can't explain that energy or that that high perhaps you get from that when you when you leave the stage. It's you feel like you've made this intimate connection that you can't experience anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Except beautifully put. Yeah. Yeah. So that that. 
I think that's probably something that I'll need a little of for the rest of my life, <laughs> right? It's one of those things that you need to have it every now and then, um, especially when you step away and you're writing or you're directing for a while. It's nice to have a reminder every now and then getting on stage about what the, the actor's responsibility is, yeah, and what they go through in the process of being ready to be, you know, to share the story on yeah. stage. So I find that very valuable, you know. And, and there's, been, there's been moments that, ah, just stay with you, you know. As a director, it's such a different experience, I think, you know. You, you probably sit with the material for so long before you even come into contact with the actors mm -hmm. that um, it lives with you. You know, the story lives with you for such a long period of time and your responsibility is to communicate that to the actors, yeah, and to help guide them. So in that sense, you're the, the nurturing mentor, yeah, um, the, the person that helps them get through the process and gets them ready for the process. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing too. That's a really exciting thing to work with performers and have them get those realizations in the rehearsal process. See, there's a, there's energy yeah. involved in that too. When yes. they get it and yes. you know yeah. they get it and it's yeah. going to portray yes. the, the way it should, mm -hmm. tell the story, mm -hmm. there's an energy involved in that right. that's indescribable also. Exactly, exactly. And then as a playwright. Yeah, there's a lot of in the head, <laughs> I think, as a playwright. That's yeah. probably the biggest difference. As a playwright, you know, it's a, it's a little bit more lonely, mm. right? You're, um, because you're experiencing the story, for, and, and you have to have all those things um, bounce off of you, and you put yourself in the role of all these different characters, right? And, and try to shape that play, right? And it's such a different process. And as a playwright, I can never separate myself from the other two skills, right? right. The other two. So when I'm writing something, I'm especially when it comes to like to stage directions, I it's hard to take off your director's hat. You know, mm -hmm. you have especially when it's 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 a moment that you know needs to happen, right? In order to move the story forward, in order to communicate the theme of the play or whatever. To it, you know, it's a plot function, perhaps, right? So, I tend to write that quite vividly, I think, in in stage directions. Yeah. Um, and then, as an actor, you know, you think to yourself, "Oh man, this work would be fun to say over and over," right? So there might be <laughs> phrases or something that. You know, as as a performer myself, I go, oh, this one's going to be juicy to deliver, or you know, this is yeah. going to be fun to play with, or the arc in this monologue. I'm, you know, I can see where an actor might take it, like if I was performing it myself, right? So, all three of those things are really enjoyable, and they're really uh, different and beautiful experiences in their in their own, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Yeah. For, on I that hope, journey. Yeah. <laughs> that was okay. <laughs> that was excellent. Um, so you studied theater in, and it was a, it was a bachelor. It was a BA. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I did Hawaiian language too, so I um, kind of double majored. Okay. And then um, went on into the MFA directing program at Manoa. Okay. Yeah. And then you came out of that. Had you met? Did you meet your husband in school? We met each other in the COP program, the this summer before we entered. <gasps> oh, college. oh! I didn't realize you'd yeah. known each other that long. Mm. And you became a couple immediately, or uh, after a little bit? After? Yeah, soon after. I mean, we hit it off as friends, and then um, we, we realized. Well, actually, he called his granny because <laughs> when he learned my maiden name. <laughs> He called his granny, cause you know she, she and had the same. she and the auntie, his great aunt, they're like the family genealogist. So. Oh, and then he found <laughs> out he wanted to know how close we were related before he pursued the relationship. 
<laughs> and it was distant. We're like seventh cousins, but still. <laughs> you can't be yeah. too careful, yeah. especially on island. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so shortly after, yes, we, you know, the courting took place and we eventually became a couple and got married while we were um, in college, actually. In school. And yeah. he was studying Hawaiian language. He was studying Hawaiian language and then linguistics, yeah. He's a... He's Dr. Kaliko Baker. Yeah, he's a PhD in linguistics. That's his his um, strength. Yeah, oh. and he's a he teaches Hawaiian language though, and storytelling. He teaches Ka'ao, yeah. actually. So there's that little performance inside him. He doesn't like to let it out too much. He's a jokester. He's a storyteller. Yeah. He's really yeah. a storyteller. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so you we went through the master's program, mm -hmm. and you uh, and Kaliko were staying on the island. Yes, we were, um, because he went from his master's straight into the PhD, mm. um, and so he was still in school. I finished my MFA, but just before I finished, an opportunity came about to get a graduate assistantship in Hawaiian language and teach, you know, beginning classes and get free tuition. And we're always looking for help, right, mm -hmm. to get through graduate school. Yeah. So I did that, and it, it opened a lot of doors for me you know it allowed me to um, learn how to be a teacher right um, and it also gave me an opportunity to give back what I had learned um, that was I think my third teaching gig actually prior to that uh, I was working with the kupuna program going into the DOE teaching second through fourth graders Hawaiiana or Hawaiian tradition and Ooh. stuff like that and then I started teaching night school actually to community classes at Kaimuki and Kaiser High School um, and then the opportunity came at Manoa at UH Manoa and um, kind of slowly worked my way up the ranks perhaps yeah. yeah from being a graduate assistant to being a lecturer and then an instructor and during that time um, uh, two of my colleagues, Kumu Kaliko, my husband, and Kumu Keave Lopez, the three of us uh, started to create new, new courses and teach courses that were performance oriented. So I created some Hawaiian language, um, like a production class, a theater production class for upper division, um, and then a playwriting class in Hawaiian. And um, Kumu Keave had his poetry and mele and hula classes and then Calico has his storytelling classes. So what we built was um, you know, a venue for students to share and showcase their work every semester. So that's something that you know, was going on for a while. Mm -hmm. And after 14 years of being in Hawaiian language, the strategic hire came, came about where Chancellor Hinshaw wanted to see Native Hawaiian scholars across the Manoa campus and proposals were taken um, from different departments and the theater was one that was approved. So um, they, I eventually got the job, went through the interview process and got the job. So it's been um, a year, this is my first year, in back in the theater, yeah? And it's kind of like a homecoming in a yeah. way, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, so what, um, take us back to the, early the decision early on to use theater as a language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tool mm -hmm. okay okay um, at that time like in 95 when we did Kalui Ko'olau the first Hawaiian language play when we did that it was really kind of uh, built on our desire to create new venues for Hawaiian language to flourish yeah, and the goal of language revitalization is really what bound the cast together. Uh, most of them were not theater people. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were hula people. There were chanters. There were musicians, but no real theater um, experience. Yeah, they were my friends, mine and Kaliko's friends that we begged to be a part of the pro the project and fed them right <laughs> <laughs> to make it happen. Um, that opened up. Uh, opportunities for us to take the work around the islands and eventually 
internationally as well to share the work. The major reason, I, I think there's probably multiple reasons why it's so important for us to be doing theater in Hawaiian. One of which is the fact that we need to have entertainment in our language. Yeah, We need to have opportunities to enjoy the language outside of the book, outside of the classroom. We need to live and experience every range of emotion in our language if we want it to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's not going to survive in the library or in the classroom. Yeah, We need to be living our language. So the theater is one venue, yeah, one media yeah, for people to experience the language and laugh and enjoy, right, and cry and, and experience these stories um, of our kupuna, yeah. yeah. Um, film as well is another media mm -hmm. that, you know, we have been trying to help develop and, and do all we can to get film in Hawaiian. You know, we've had a couple of projects that we've worked on, but TV, yeah, the, all the different forms of media, if the kids don't have that, it's not going to be, they're, they're not going to be fully rounded. Yeah. yeah? They're going to turn on Disney Channel, right? They're going to turn on MTV, yeah? They're going to go and watch a movie at Ward Theater or Dole Cannery and, and, and not choose to do something in Hawaiian if it's not available to them, right? So really uh, creating entertainment in the language and giving the possibility to do art in the language. Because art is what it, we use to express ourselves. Yeah? And without, without art, we become empty. Yeah? We become dull and mundane. So to create that venue, that was really important. Um, the other thing is education, right? It, it becomes a tool for education. Through the language, we can tell stories, right? We can pass down histories. We can um, enlighten, yeah, and inspire, really. Um, aside from those things, uh, you know, yes, I've used it as a language teaching tool in the classroom, yeah, to help students, you know, like the natural progression of role playing, taking it a step further into being on stage and actually acting something out. So students have the opportunity to learn proper grammar, mm. learn things that are contextually, you know, proper, correct, culturally expressions, right? Yeah. And they memorize their lines, and memorizing their lines gets what we call ho'opa na'ao. So it gets stuck to our na'ao, right? To our inside, and it's something they carry forever and ever. Um, I've seen students, sometimes, you know, I bump into students, and at the beach or at the shopping mall, and they tell me, Kumu, I still know my lines, <laughs> you know? And then they'll rattle oh, it off funny. for me. Oh, they you know? really do. <laughs> and I'm like, well, my ka'i, homo, you know? Like, continue. And then I try to get them to converse again, right? Because it's there, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I had to memorize a monologue in Italian for uh. a show, and I remember that monologue. I don't remember anything that came before or after it uh -huh, in English, uh -huh. but I remember that monologue because y you have to make it stick with you. Exactly. It, it, yeah, and there are words that I learned how to use because mm. they were in a script, so I had, to, oh, I have to say it, I better look it up, find out what I'm saying. Exactly, you know? exactly. Um, so tell me about, you really, um, the three of you really were pioneers at University of Hawaii with this language program. Can you tell yeah. us about it now, here and... Okay, um, okay, yeah. okay. Um, so the classes, with, with my position, I'm really fortunate with my position right now, that part of my responsibility is actually to maintain a connection with Native Hawaiian um, communities and with uh, Hawaii Nuiakea School of Hawaiian Knowledge. So every year, I still get to teach a class in that department, yeah, mm -hmm. my former um, home. <laughs> and so we continue to do projects together, and those showcases is one of those projects. 
So students come together and they get to perform, whether it be an original melee composition or hula that they learn or a theater piece that they learn, um, stories that they learn. They get to share the language and live the language. Um, so that's one thing there. Down the road, yeah, um, and I'll share this with you, one of the, well, I was hired as a catalyst to build the Hawaiian theater program. So in building the program and developing new courses and curriculum, I'm also looking at um, an MFA in Hawaiian theater slash performance. So that particular degree will be um, shared in a sense. There will be courses that students will have a choice to take in Kauai Huelani Center for Hawaiian Language, um, in the music department, yeah. Uh, they, we're looking at developing something that kind of crosses all the different traditional performance forms into the contemporary theater that's happening now. Mm -hmm. So students would get all of that in, and, and probably performance oriented. There's still a lot to discuss and to work out, but we're looking at, you know, becoming the first, the only, yeah, entity that awards an MFA in Hawaiian theater wow. performance. How exciting Yeah, yeah it's is super that? exciting. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. It's a dream. Yeah. It's really a dream. You know, yeah. I think to myself, if that was there when I came to school, I would have signed up for that. <laughs> right? And I'm hoping that there's other students who would be interested too. I mean, we need to build the interest in the student body as well yeah. in order to make the program happen. And that's something that we're very conscious of and, you know, we're working towards doing outreach and awareness. Yeah. And you have already done some work with um, uh, touring in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. We, we have. Um, we've had the opportunity to go with, uh, and it was a, a joint venture actually, with Kapahulo Kalelehua under the direction of Kumu, Kumuhula Snowbird Bento, um, and myself as the director of Kahalo Hanakiaka. We did a joint uh, collaboration tour where we, um, I guess if we're looking at a lay analogy, we vili, yeah, we wove the, or braided the, the two halau together and um, shared a couple of traditional stories through uh, theater, hula, and song. Oh, wonderful. And we toured the North Island, actually, of New Zealand a couple of years ago. Yeah. And was it in Hawaiian? It was in Hawaiian, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So well, I went to the showcase you were talking about with the students, and most mm, of that yes. was in Hawaiian, and yes. which I don't understand. I uh -huh. pick up a word here or there, um, <laughs> er erroneously <laughs> sometimes. But uh, I, I knew the gist of what uh -huh. was going on. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is that what was going on there? Uh, you know, those who speak Maori, um, can get a lot more than someone who just doesn't speak another language, you know, like mm. is, is not familiar with Polynesian languages. Uh, we notice that when they're talking Maori to us, we get a pretty good percentage, you, you know? So you it know? would be something like French and Spanish. Right, right, okay. yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of cognates, right? Mm. Like word crossover. And actually our grammar is very, very similar. Um, so we can kind of understand each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the sounds, yeah. To, to, uh, to me, I studied a little Spanish and uh -huh. French, so the sound of the Hawaiian language is so for foreign, literally, right, right, to me. Right, 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 yeah. Um, they just, the sounds don't make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, okay, yeah. I didn't understand that about it. Uh, so that's cool. And did they bring anything here? Was there an exchange? Um, well, they, and that, that's a separate um, endeavor, actually. A um, few years ago, we uh, actually bumped into uh, different artists down there in Aotearoa, and we tried to create a connection, you know, and there was talk, and this was actually in 2005 at the World Indigenous Peoples Conference on Education in Waikato, in Aotearoa. And so there was a group from Australia, an Aboriginal group, Yakin Yara, yeah? And they're a, uh, an Aboriginal theater company. They're one of the first Aboriginal mm -hmm. theater companies in Australia, actually. 
and then there was Takirua Productions, which is a Maori theater company, and there were Canadian, native Canadians too there as well. And so we talked and wanted to create a, an exchange of some sort where we would tour to one another's places. That just hasn't come to fruition yet, and I, okay. I hope to put more energy into something like that and be able to take Hawaiian um, theater down there and then they can bring their stuff up here. The There has been a couple of shows that have come from Aotearoa with Tawata Productions and while they were here, you know, we were able to host them, get together, have a hui and talk stories. And, and still there's, there's this idea of let's exchange, let's exchange, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. support and network. And it, it's just such a wonderful thing to see other Polynesian people, other Pacific people, right, having the same momentum and the same movement, trying to develop their, their stories in the medium of theater, yeah, and share that and take that out to the public. Yeah. It, it helps you, I think, and inspires you to go further because you know, you know you're not the only one doing it and you know that you're plugged into something real and something that others around the world feel is just as important as you do. So, yeah, yeah. it's very exciting. <laughs> I hope that happens. I hope we can be a part uh, at Kumukuhu of, of making that happen. That would um, be awesome. I yeah. think, uh, I, I would really like to see um, us have exchanges with other theaters mm -hmm. all over the world. Yes. Um, because I believe that our stories are all, our stories are all the same. Mm -hmm. And it is the sharing, the understanding of the links in our humanity that mm -hmm. solve the problems of the world. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> if you really exactly. understand that you yeah. are you are Ohana with the mm -hmm. person sitting next to you, mm -hmm. then it changes the way you interact with them. Exactly. Um, so we just have a little bit of time okay. left. No, it's no, oh, wow. Bye. But I want to make sure that we talk about the Net Conference oh, coming yes. up and yes. your involvement okay. with that. Yeah. And the Net is the Network of Ensemble Theaters. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. national organization that mm -hmm. has put together. Um, microfests in isolated but places of isolation. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Detroit, mm -hmm. which is shrinking in on itself mm -hmm. um, uh, um, by design now, uh, New Orleans mm -hmm. and Appalachia mm -hmm. and the, um, uh, in particular the Hardin, Kentucky area where they, mm -hmm. they experience a lot of floods. They mm -hmm. literally are mm -hmm. isolated. Um, and now Honolulu, in, in yes. the middle of the ocean. And uh, theater, uh, not dignitaries, but well-known theater people mm -hmm. from some very established, respectable theaters across the country mm -hmm. are going to be here. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's very yes. cool. Yeah. Combined with, and there's an invitation to the general community mm -hmm. to join as well to explore how art um, affects our lives mm -hmm. and can affect our lives mm -hmm. and then uh, so so let's talk about because you're part of the first the track on the very first yes, day right the very first day so give us a snapshot of okay. what people are going to experience okay. so if people choose to do the Hawaiian language track then they will be um, put on a bus yeah everybody gets on buses and then they go out and I think that's the beauty of this you're not going to just stay in downtown Honolulu. You have the opportunity to go all over the island, actually. Mm -hmm. So they'll be taken to the windward side, up to Ha'iku, um, up to the campus of Kekula Okamakau. Yeah, Kekula Osanga Manayakalani Kamakau, I should say his whole name. And up at that school, I've been working there, there with them this semester, and the students, we've written an original play. So part of that tour up to the school is going to be uh, a piece of their work that we've developed um, and then a talk story after that. There is also going to be a, a lecture or a, a, a short talk on the history of the Hawaiian language, um, its status today, and the Hawaiian revitalization movement. Um, also following that is going to be a uh, presentation from students from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, our graduate students who have participated and you actually saw them perform at the La Mele, yeah. right? Um, so they're going to be sharing 
uh, particular styles of song or poetry that they've studied and then performing that. Um, we're going to have a little Hawaiian language lesson and game <laughs> in the day and then we have lunch, lunch together up at that campus. Okay. Yeah. And there, the different tracks that they're using, there's one that studies um, ecology, farming, farming. Yeah, farming. Um, one is hiking, I believe, so getting up into the forest. Yeah. And then there's the Hawaiian language, and one more. I'm there's something to have to do with energy. Yeah, I think, yeah. But I don't know what that um, track Sustainability, like. maybe, yeah, or something maybe. like that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what they all, what they all look like mm -hmm. yet. So they go through two days of these tracks. Yes. And then two days of discussion. Right. Uh, about right, what right. they've and had performance. an opportunity. And performance. There will be performances out there at Mokulea as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't realize yeah, that. With the national companies that are coming. I'm so excited about yeah, this. Yeah, me I'm too. Excited. And you know, before I go any further, <laughs> okay. and, um, uh, I just want to make sure that I say there is, it, I put some of this information on our Facebook page oh, and great. on our website. So okay. if you go to kumukuhua.org or check us out, Kumukuhua, on Facebook, I put not only the link to the NET conference information, but also they're looking for volunteers yes. for all of these different tracks. Mm -hmm. And if you take part, um, as if you volunteer, then mm -hmm. you get a free ride. Yeah. Yes. for that evening's activities. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I think it's going to be pretty spectacular mm -hmm. to be a part of. Yeah. We have just a few minutes left. Is there anything okay. else you'd like to say? I can't believe I don't know. Thank you. That went by really quickly. I know. I know. It did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, I will say we also had an opportunity to work together in yes. um, a master class that Kumukuhua had this mm -hmm. summer in mm -hmm. conjunction with Inner Island Terminal on collaborative writing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, collaboration between writers, directors, and actors to produce pieces. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that is what Kumukuhua will be presenting during the NET conference um, in Kaka'ako on that Saturday morning. Yeah, mm -hmm. two yeah. of the pieces that Tammy wrote that are so very touching. I um, have the pleasure of delivering one of the monologues that Tammy wrote, and as an actor, I can tell you that this is one of those pieces that you go, oh, yes, <laughs> I get to sink my teeth into that awesome. one. It's uh, it's an exceptionally well-written piece. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. I'm going to say my little wrap-up now. We're okay. out of time. <laughs> we'll have to leave it there. This is Donna Blanchard for Think Tech Radio. We've been discussing theater with our guest, Tammy Haile Opua. I don't say it right. Haile Opua. Mm -hmm. Was yes. that right? Yeah. Tammy Haile Opua Baker um, of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you so much for coming down, Tammy. Thank you for having me. And thanks for listening. Think Tech will be back next Wednesday for the Arts in Hawaii show with your host, Donna Blanchard. So please tune in on Think Tech Hawaii or on thinktechhawaii.com, and we'll see you then. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. <laughs> mm -hmm.